Welcome to Movie of the Year, the only podcast that has the science and the screaming to determine what the best movie is of any given year. Before I introduce this week's panelists, know this, that this show is also a game in which points are awarded for well-made arguments, cogent thoughts about the film, jokes, and anything else I feel like awarding. The winner will be my best friend for a week and have gloating rights. Also, my name is Mike Gravagna, your tyrannical host. <laughs> With me, as always, is... Hold on. I'm getting a note. Oh, that's interesting. All right, I'll introduce the... Okay, so with me, as always, is Greg. Yeah! I stole your entrance music, Mike. I, you know what? I loved it for that. <laughs> Greg. You got yeah. a point for that. The first of many, Mike. I think so. And uh, so, sorry about that little uh, unprofessional snafu there in the beginning. I was given a note by... A your other panelist, Ryan. Ryan, everybody cheer for Ryan. Yeah, everybody. boo no. Uh, uh his drama. His <laughs> note said he is so confident that he can talk about this show better than you. Okay. That he's going to do so with his proverbial hand tied behind his back. This note was long, and given that that would not actually affect his performance, he <laughs> will try to win without talking at all. Whoa. So if like I were to just simply insult you the entire show, then maybe I would like lose points. Yeah. I mean, that's maybe. not even a thing, right? That we don't ha- I don't know how to remove points. I can only give double. Yeah, points. right. So I might win just one to nothing. But you know what? I'm gonna run up the score, Mike. No sportsmanship here. Right. I appreciate yeah. that, but also you know what? Right. Ooh, okay, right. okay. I like boldness. We have a so competition Ryan... here, people. <laughs> right now we are neck and neck. Will it stay Ooh. that way? Who knows? But probably not, though. Don't you think? But probably not. <laughs> probably, I mean, not probably not talking seems like a real shit yourself with a fucking foot. Probably I'll just win. Yeah, just sitting there silently, shaking your head no. Well, I he has been reading books about how to verbally communicate, or non-verbally communicate, <laughs> rather. And Mike, uh, Has there ever been a better show uh, for, to not have our resident movie guy on than this particular well, movie? <laughs> I do think so. Ryan, everybody knows Ryan's the movie guy. The movie guy. But you're a cinema freak, and I'm a film buff. So isn't that a little better than the movie guy? <laughs> we no, it, it's it. It'll be interesting. We're gonna wade our way through. Uh, and just w- what about two dudes who have watched a fair amount of movies? Yes. What do they think about this very uh, artistically challenging kind of, film? Kind of dense text. <laughs> it. <laughs> Russian arc. Yes. Greg, did you know this movie existed before we were going to do it for this show? Um, To me, before we did the show, Mike, if you had said there's a movie called Russian arc, I wouldn't know if you had just made that up in that moment. Like, is it like one of the movies from 30 Rock? Like one of the movies from Seinfeld that they all go to see as a group? I I, I don't know. Uh, I have no history with this movie except for I've watched it two and a half times for this show. Uh, I'll raise you that. I watched the beginning four times and then the whole movie once because I kept trying to watch and go, I am too sleepy for this movie. <laughs> this is a, a little bit of a sleepy movie. You may turn it on thinking I am completely awake and I probably won't fall asleep for eight or nine hours. Uh, this movie will find the, the little corner of you that is tired mm-hmm. and it will coax that part out until like sometimes I can feel myself falling asleep during a movie this movie, I would just suddenly be like, whoa, okay, I guess I was asleep. My dreams are crazy. <laughs> I'm floating through a museum. Uh, there is, uh, for a former job, uh, I had to read Accounting for Dummies and because I needed to learn about accounting. And man, so many unexpected naps showed up <laughs> and with Accounting for Dummies. And Russian, it's not, also it is confusing because it's Russian arc with a K. Yes. But if you say it fast or with a Russian accent, Russian arc, uh, it could be Russian art, which also seems to be what the movie is about. That's in there too. So it's it's in there. All I know is I after watching this, and even after we've said we've tried to or almost fell asleep a bunch, I tried to look up any of this guy's other films, and they are not streaming anywhere. So I'd say that gives it points in a good way. Is I liked it enough that then I was like, well, I should probably watch all of his other shit right now. Yeah, it's interesting because it's going to sound like right off the bat, like we hate the movie or something. Uh, And that's certainly not it. I think you can really appreciate and enjoy and be Mm. getting a lot out of this movie uh, while also then like kind of nodding off. And we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about the, the reason that is, but like 
there's just some transitory periods in this movie or some things that like linger for a long time and um there's not anything wrong with that it's just that's when you might potentially sort of like drift off and and we often talk about how movies can be so many things and uh i'm a red-blooded american man the movie i watched the last movie I watched before Russian Ark was the Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah. They are playing on different wavelengths. They really are. Uh, for me, Mike, it was Kong Skull Island. And I got to say, oh, a very rips. similar thing. I, I did not one time think I was going to nod off during Kong Skull Island. I would love to do a show about that someday. I love that movie. I did too, man. And uh, like it, the movie it most reminds me of is Death Race 2000. In that yes. like, it's just like so at first you're like, I don't think they know how over the top they're being. And then by the middle of the movie, you're like, oh, no, okay. I see. They they're really engaging know. with that. <laughs> I watched Kong Skull Island in Vietnam, where it was a lot of it was filmed. Yeah, you were literally in Vietnam. <laughs> and then went on a boat, and there was like islands that just come out of the mist and just kept being like, where are they? Where are all the skulls? I have to say, when I think of your military service, I I don't think of it as being in um, Vietnam. I think of it as I think that as being too far in the past. But yeah. I'm older than you think. Yeah. Mike. thank you. <laughs> I saw some shit in Nam when I was there for my honeymoon. <laughs> well, with that, we're talking a lot about Russian arc, so we let's sure just are. dive right in. We're gonna take the quickest of breaks, and when we come back, Russian arc. Russian Ark is an experimental film following an unnamed narrator, probably a ghost, who <laughs> follows the European through the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, crossing through over 300 years of Russian history, where they're sometimes seen and sometimes they're invisible because it's wacky. <laughs> Director Alexander and narrator Alexander Sokurov, Sokurov shot the film in a single 96-minute Steadicam shot with over 2,000 actors and three orchestras. They had to restart three times and almost lost all the light they needed. Tasty Greg, I ask you this. Stanley Kaufman once asked about Russian Ark, at least according to Ebert, what is there intrinsically in the film that would gri grip us if it had been made, even excellently made, in the usual edited manner? Instead of focusing on why they chose to use one shot to make this movie, what if they didn't? Would there be enough to this movie? Like, as a viewer, did you focus on the, 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 oh, this is one shot? Did you forget about it or some sort of combination? I would say I often forgot about it, but the feeling persisted. Um, it does, after a while, I think it kind of blends into the feeling of the movie. Greg. And it stops feeling like a stunt. Um, mm. We uh, we have done a Patreon segment about... Um, one oneers as they're called long oneers and oftentimes they feel tenuous they feel like um you almost feel see? tired as the viewer yeah see what i did this i tried one... to do this in film school and they told me to stop it but now you can't stop me <laughs> this one feels a little bit less like hey check me out yeah like the tone of voice you were just doing but at the <laughs> same time as to the central question of like what if you had this movie without this one this one central idea, which is that it, it is just one shot. Like, would it still be something? And you know what, Mike? I'm going to say yes, because Ooh, I really enjoy, like, the fact that, like, it's totally unclear what's going on here. Like, the main character seems to be a ghost. We don't see the main character. He, like, is the camera. He has yeah. a friend who's a ghost from a completely different time period. They go through multiple time periods. I think the the odd structure of whatever kind of afterlife this is, it's like a... It's like an antechamber for mm. oblivion. Because I don't, like, it's not purgatory. You're not doing your sins and then going to heaven. It's like Right. Oh, is that what purgatory is? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the Catholic concept of purgatory is that there is a state in between life and he heaven. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to hell, you just go straight to hell. If you go to purgatory, it's like hell light, and you have your sins harrowed or scourged away. So you burn uh. um, in, like, you you do burn in fire, but they the the it's a lighter fire, fire. Yeah, it's purifying you, and people can like pray to get you out or offer masses up. Money. You. Yeah, you know it's 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 it is Catholic I guess, stuff. So. Yeah, in in my I've read more fantasy books than religious books. Yeah, uh, who could say which one's real? And <laughs> and those there's purgatory type things, but there was like gray and limbo s and like it's boring. Isn't that yeah. awful to be bored for eternity? Like there's you know there's like the the. Uh, 
the classic Greek conception of the afterlife, which is just mm-hmm. like yeah, everything is boring. And then eventually they're like, well, maybe there's a good part and kind of a boring part. And you go to the fields of Elysium, right. and that's like you're a hero. You d- you deserve that. Um, and then there's like the what what this movie actually reminded me of the most is more like sort of the Mexican concept of the afterlife, where like you die once and then you go to the afterlife until nobody on earth remembers you and then you t- you go through like a second death where you are kind of like then you're finally erased because there's no record of you anymore and that's what this feels like it feels like because the very last thing is like a very stark going outside and it's just like and it's everybody we've met all 2000 actors we've and they met. all file out and they go through this dark door that like you just would never go through if someone showed yeah. you that door and went walk through that you'd be like no thank you and so it does say Bloody Mary. See what happens. <laughs> and obviously everybody in there, time is messed up in there. And so there's right, a whole bunch it's of- not, we should say going through is not like, okay, well, here's the earliest Russian history. And then we're no. plotting through in the next and the next. And the next. I don't know a lot about Russian history, but I know based on costumes and uniforms that they are jumping back and forth throughout. Yeah, it seems like they hit a few of the main ones a couple of times, but they definitely, it's not like a trip, it's not a trip back through history. It's not like, there's no kind of order to it. And as you said, Mike, the rules also seem to change. There seem to be people who like, they they work in the afterlife in the same way that they might work in a museum. Like they like right, shut, the dose they, sense. Yeah, they like <laughs> escort them out and they like make them keep moving and... It, it, or if that's what those people really are. I mean, the, the right. movie doesn't tell you what's going on. And that's part of why I think it's more than just one big long shot. It's because, like, at no point does it explain even a little bit of, like, why. At one point, there's a there's the doctor and the actor pop up. Mm-hmm. And one of them, like, st- starts talking about this painting. And the other one is like, I don't think I'm that sick. The doctor said that I was probably going to die, but I don't think I'm going to. I think I'm actually going to be fine. And it's like, oh, bud, you are dead. You're dead. And then that's, I I think the easiest way to wrap your head around this movie is this is a non-scary ghost movie. Like it's a non-scary horror movie. Uh, And it's, it's not scary. It's not scary in the sense of like something that would make Mike uh, get scared. But there's a lot of stuff that like, there's darkness in this movie where the camera suddenly moves into darkness or where suddenly we feel that we have changed where we are in mm-hmm. time or something that is deeply It's creepy. unsettling. Yeah. And and I do think it's in um, The Sixth Sense or if you're a Goosebumps kid like me, uh, The Ghost Next Door, the twist at the end is the narrator was the ghost the whole time. Oh, no, or The Others. It- it, it or the others. It does feel like anytime there, it's a ghost movie and people are like there's a twist. You're like, is the main is character it because the ghost? The main character? <laughs> is it actually the ghost? Is it the one ghost twist they have? No, uh, <laughs> go see the movie. It it feels like more than those. Those are like, haha, you didn't see that coming. And this is like, well, what if you were that ghost? You would be lost and confused, yeah, the whole time, yeah. And it 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 either felt like that or if like kid in King Arthur's court or what is that Yankee. A Yankee, a Yankee King in, in, in Arthur's court. Yankee King Arthur's court. I couldn't remember the adjective. A Connecticut Yankee. <laughs> uh, if you went through time, your brain would be scrambled to the point that it would be like flashing in and out, and you would not be sure what was going yeah. on at all times. And it does capture like a drunk rolling brownout. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how much of conscious reality is our brain just trying to turn it into an experience that we can understand and it's like and to do that we just ignore most of what's going on all of the time and and our unconscious brain just kind of like processes it Mm -hmm. but like it's so overwhelming to exist as much as this movie is about the afterlife it very much feels to me like it's just about life too because we don't know why we're here we don't know what we're supposed to do do we just walk the halls do we talk to each other are we supposed to be good to each other does it matter should we follow the rules should we try to figure out like the answers to these questions or just experience the fact that we're in like a a palace for a little bit and i I like that that the unnamed narrator at first he's like where am i what's going on am i dead okay i think i'm here based on their clothes and you see for the first everybody's ignoring him but then the european is like hey bud i'm gonna say something real snarky and shitty about the russians and he's like wait you can see me (laughs) uh and then they go their separate ways for a while yes but then more people can't see him and i think it's so human to be like i don't know if i like this guy but this is the one person who acknowledges that I exist. I will cling to him for the rest of the time I have the next yeah. time I run into him. And did you notice that um, 
the there seemed to be a lot of other there seemed to be some people who were alive and the ghosts were kind of moving around them being mm-hmm. alive i felt like the ball was very much living people. oh yeah um right. but then there was also very clearly characters that are also ghosts and i noticed that they paired up did you notice how many they're all all the ghosts are pairs like there's the doctor and the actor there's the two sailors right. like <laughs> i just oh those two sailors i thought were gonna kick the shit out of somebody in the middle of that museum that was well, also they got up in his face yeah you know i, I there is um the like the the figure in Russian lore of like the saintly fool or like the 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 saintly um uh, disabled person is so important mm. and like the guy keeps saying she's an angel so everybody notices that the European is being like so like out of nowhere vindictively cruel to her right. that yeah the sailors are like I think we're gonna have to right. kill this dead guy <laughs> <laughs> well that that it makes sense is that they don't know it, in my head the narrator died pretty early on in Russian history, maybe, but he knows a lot. Maybe he was a Russian historian. He knows a lot. And so does the European, but everybody else is in a more modern room when they run into them. It feels like the other ghosts don't necessarily know that they are ghosts. I think the doctor and the actor there are, that's such an important, everything feels random, right? Yeah. But that, that is such an important pairing they run into because that he says, I'm sick, but I'm going to get better. Is like, look, if, I'm not going to say we're all ghosts, but this is the most apparent I can be with what is going on here. I do have one thing. I, I, I agree with everything you said, except for one thing. I think the narrator is um, a 21st century man. I think he is oh, okay. like, from 2000, 2002, because there's things he says to the European that show that he knows history after what right. the European knows, because the European sees the beginning of like the um, Bolshevik revolution. And mm-hmm. he's like, oof, what's all this? And uh, the guy's like, well, it lasts for like 80 years. And that would put him like right around because Bolshevik oh, okay. re- re- Revolution, right? 19 teens. Right. So that would put it right around 2000. And is that with Anastasia? Is that where that happened? Yeah, like the Romanovs and okay. the Anastasia. Yeah, that's like they kept the, the Romanovs for a while in, in, a, in a house. And then they were like, what are we going to do with them? And then they were <laughs> afraid that um, they were going to lose control of them, basically. And so they just took them out of the basement, shot them all. Yeah. Now, I noticed um, Anastasia's best friend, Batrock, was not here, and neither was her mortal enemy, Rasputin. Is <laughs> yeah, dude. That... <laughs> Rasputin legit. I was like, which guy is Rasputin? You got it, right? I, th- I wonder if there is something about the character of Rasputin that looms very large in the Western conception of Russia, mm. because he is so other. He's... Um, seems, you know, kind of demonic. He seems like, you know, oh, they shot him and they drown him and they right. hanged him. And he, uh, his dick was like supposed to be like 13 inches long. And they like apparently <laughs> took Hell it off yeah. his body and like put it in a jar because they're like, look at this fucking hog, man. We can't just throw this away with the rest <laughs> of the guy. Uh, but so I wonder if all of that stuff, which is so important to the West for otherizing other nations, right. all of those individual things. And especially because uh, Russia is... To us, the East, Russia is is the center of the world to Russia, but to us, we've always thought of it as like the East. And so they've always had this opposition with the West. And so, yeah, I think there's a chance at least that like that guy means a lot to us and Russians just don't really think of him as much as we do. Right. Or they're not like, ooh, just like they maybe they tell stories about Thomas Jefferson and what a weird creep he was. Uh huh. And we're like, what? He's just like, he's a guy. He has some problems. And I imagine, you know, it's kind of a thorny position because the um, Bolshevik revolution does lead then to like the communists taking power, mm. which had then fallen away in the nineties, but that led to the oligarchs taking power and basically stealing everything f- that they could get their hands on. And so I just wonder if the history gets kind of muddled for them and they right. don't like, they don't want it. Nope. They don't want to talk. It's not going to touch it. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's too much, too much stuff. Or the other thing is, there's a lot going on in this movie that, like, I don't know about your version. I assume because it, this, this is the way it works out, we usually have the same versions. Mm-hmm. But um, the subtitles were kind of spare in my version, including if it wasn't the European or the uh, narrator. narrator speaking, we got almost nothing. So, like, somebody literally could have walked through and said something that would have signified that that person was hey, Rasputin. Yeah, I'm Rasputin. Yeah. I just don't have my beard. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who that guy was. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was a, a little bit of a shame, I thought, was that they? I wish they had just figured out how to translate more of it. And this is a problem right. I've had with a couple different movies that we've watched in translation. It's just like, wait, no, that guy clearly said something and you just didn't put anything up for him. Why not? 
And I wonder for this one, it's so immersive, and there are 2,000 people not talking all at once, but, and I wonder if they're like, uh, like, it would be great moving through the parties to just hear yes. what people were actually saying to each other, yeah. you know? I was thinking if the, the re- having re- watched recently, like, Empire Records and Can't Hardly Wait, much, I'm going to say, go out on limb, dumber movies, uh-huh. uh, but movies I love, there are huge party scenes, but you just hear clips and snippets and it builds an atmosphere of the environment yeah and but it feels very pointed to not do it he's like like i'm gonna leave you in the dark the way the narrator's in the dark maybe i don't know yeah but it like that's a for americans (laughs) yeah i mean it's a localization issue that's the thing like i think if anything the director would be uh, a little upset about it because like Mm. You know, they did the audio separate from the, mm-hmm. the just the visual. So that means that he, at anything that is said, he very purposely went in and put right. in, in like the background. And when we were doing like our research for the the Patreon one or segment, I noticed how much audio really is a major part of it. Um, and you know what you hear people saying kind of in the background and the way they they exist as an audio version in that three dimensional space matters. And so. Yeah. I don't think that there's any part of this that we didn't understand because we didn't get that. But I just like when you put 2000 people in there to only hear from like two or three or four of them, it just seems like a shame. You really feel it. Yes. Well, this movie's a lot. There's so much more to dig into. So instead, we're going to take the quickest of breaks, come back and talk about something completely different. Mount Rushmore. That's right. You know what that sound means because that little voice says it. <laughs> it's Mount Rushmore. The mountain dedicated to the four prettiest foreheads ever seen on a U.S. president. Except that is not what tonight's Mount Rushmore is about, Greg. No. It's not we what we're doing. are building what some say are fans' favorite mountain every season. It's when we let our hair down. Oh, yeah. Let our cartoon hearts pump out of our suit breasts and our tongues turn into little stairs and little of us walk out of our mouths and then hearts pump out of our eyes. It's Hot Boys of 2002. Ooh. Uh, you Listeners, you can't tell this, but I'm actually uh, on my belly on my bed with my feet kicked up in the, he- in the air um, and I'm swinging them back and forth mm-hmm. and I've got... Mm-hmm. Uh, tiger beat magazine open up to a a full page spread here and what i think i think why we love this so much why listeners so love us so much that tiger beat heels kicked in the air vibe greg is uh remember when you had just as much of a crush on jtt as you did marissa who sat next to you in chem class these are equally powerful emotions (laughs) (laughs) for sure for sure and you know like uh whether or not you experience same-sex attraction, when it comes to hot boys, even if you don't want to be with them, you just want to be them so bad. Mm. You know, you just want to fill that role somehow. Yeah, fill that. Fill it right up. Roll. It might be a tight squeeze, but you know what? You're going to get in there. So, Greg, we'll start with you. Yeah, start with me. Give me your first nominee for a 2002 hot boy. Come right to me. Um... On the verge of becoming a man, uh, but not in that awkward period, um, we see a lean, mean fighting machine version of one Leonardo DiCaprio in our 2002 season. Uh, A little bit of that baby fat melted away, and what we're left with is the, the chiseled, lean figure of a man in his prime. And this is Leo. He's in Catch Me If You Can this year. He's in... Uh, Gangs in New York. Gangs in New York. Did yes, a show for you. Uh, I think there are. He's not every year between like ninety seven here, but there are so many years he would be on the mountain. And he's given you right. a lot of different looks. That's the thing, because like when you're yes. doing like what's eating Gilbert Grape, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he's just so still so young. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the real, I guess, Tiger Beat version of him. But I feel like you still he's still got that heat on him, Mike. Even even in Titanic, he's such a baby boy when you go back and look at yes. him. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I feel like only in the last five years, we were like, oh, he's an adult now. <laughs> <laughs> but the people he's dating, not always. <laughs> they stay the same age. <laughs> all uh, right. All gr- right. All right. Leo is going right up onto the mountain. Woo. Give me another one. 
Another one. I'm going to give you another one right off the top of the dome. And I, I feel like I'm breaking a little bit of the boys part of it. But I just got to go with this because I got to speak from the heart. Um, the heart. Tom Cruise was like, I think, at his perfect uh, look in like the the early 2000 period really starting from 99 when we saw him in eyes wide shut mm. um but in minority report uh not only is it his most interesting role but i just feel like his look is basically perfect in minority report he's he's not weird looking the way he was as a youth and he's not crows feed it out the way he is now yeah he you know he's like yeah he's just like uh he's just he doesn't have that boyish appeal anymore um but he looks like tough and still chiseled um and his face is is like you know very expressive i think he's lost a little bit of that as he's he's Mm. gotten older he is going to be on the maybe pile because we got to keep it interesting got to keep it interesting now, going back and forth, Greg, it is your turn. You are up. Who's next? All right. Going, I've moved away from the men, and now I'm going to start uh, talking about the boys. Um, and I'm going to go with Orlando Bloom, who uh, was giving us yes. beautiful Legolas action at this time. Um, and not yet the, the pirates movies though, but that's, that's on the horizon for him. Uh, and just so boyish and young, but it is, I think when people are like, Ooh, Orlando Bloom, not, I don't think it's the pirates. It's definitely Legolas. And then those freaks out there. Some of them are like Elizabeth town. Mm. Oh, get out of here with that. It's when he but, uh, rides this, the shield like a snowboard. Yes, That's when everybody he, was like, this movie is sh- perfect. I'm in white, love with Sean this man. White hairstyle is going in the wind. Yes. He looks like a he looks like a kind of like Nordic alien figure yes. in this. And then but you know what? Bloom comes in and off, so often when we get either elves or like Vulcans, um they're always played the same way. Orlando mm-hmm. Bloom, I think in retrospect did a really good job of like playing a an elf where you can see that he's an elf, but he doesn't seem so ethereal and weird and otherworldly that we don't identify with him. They don't say it. They, they call Legolas a straight up elf, but in every other fantasy subgenre series, he's a half elf. Yeah. Like right? that is his vibe is like, yeah. yeah, I have the elf skills, but I also have a personality. Yeah. It, yeah. Like I, I, I don't know what his history is, but he's got very like, I grew up around, around humans or mm-hmm. my mom is secretly a human vibes. That's what I've been thinking about that my own mom for years. That she secretly she might be a human? Secretly be a human. That's the dream. Orlando Bloom also right up on the mountain. And uh, let's see. Going to the, it is your turn yet again. It is me. Okay, let's see. It's come back to me. Who am I going to go with here? Because I don't want to leave any out there to get snatched up by somebody <laughs> else, Mike. That's the thing that I'm really worried about. Okay, here we go. Um, I don't know if this guy is to everybody's taste, but... I feel like he's really grown on me over the years. Um, and he was so beautiful all the way back then. He's still with us now. But uh, Ryan Reynolds. Um, okay. He was like, uh, he was on Two Dudes, A Girl, and A Pizza Place. Two Guys, A Girl, and A Pizza Place. Yes. A few seasons in, they cut off the end of Pizza Place. And a Pizza Place, because they were like, that's the problem with this show. <laughs> Is that... Too much pizza place. I fucking loved that show. He and dude, he was so good on it, and he very much like developed his um, shtick. Yeah, his shtick on that show. But uh, also, shout out to Ryan Reynolds. He, for some reason, he started a a mobile phone network, and he just sold it for a billion dollars. His <laughs> latter day career, people are like, well, Deadpool. No, no, no. It's the the mobile. He also has a vodka. He has he, a soccer yeah, he club. A, a soccer club and the, the and they show instantly got the good as soon as he bought them. And he taught me how to say Rob McElhenney's name, so that's nice. Rob. <laughs> you know what? Point for laughing at my joke. <laughs> uh, Reynolds. So what? What is Ron Reynolds doing in two thousand and two? I just can't place him. What he's actually up to in 2002. I think he was still in... Oh, you know what? I think he was in that movie Waiting. In O2? Man, yeah. Where that movie played. is rough That is rough. Back. And he he's just coming he's out multiple man. years of being the number one dude on two guys, a girl, and a pizza place, Mike. Come on, man. Yes. 
Uh, he is going to go on the maybe pile. Uh, it is your turn yet again. Okay, back to me. It might be time for speed round. To start speed rounding these? Yeah. Okay, how about this? Check this out. Zach Efron. He was in 17 again. In 02? Well, I think so, yeah. No, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, in my head, he, he shows up so much later in life, but that, I, <laughs> it's, I mean, if Zach Efron was doing things in 2002, Zach Efron is on this gosh darn mountain. And he ought to be. Um, I have to, if I had to pick one Jonas brother, which I understand that I do, I'm going to go with Joe Jonas. Okay. You know what? No, I hate the Jonases. I will never put them on any mountain. No, Joni. Okay. I won't do that. Um, how about very big at this particular time? Ricky Martin. Live in La Vida Loca, Mike. Greg. Greg, your <laughs> Mount Rushmore of Hot Boys 2002, I just typed in Ricky Mountain, is Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio, Orlando Bloom, Zac Efron, and Ricky Mountain. <laughs> your b- 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 bonus, uh, you would have gotten so many points, which I know you need right now. If you had said Johnny Knoxville, Jackass 1 came out this year, and that's wow, like, wow, wow. I think when he became a sex symbol. Or, I know we normally do movies, but in the TV realm, Mi- Milo, Milo Vinmitalia was tearing it up as the bad boy Jess on Gossip Girl. Oh. Not Gossip Girl, the other one, Gilmore Girls. Gilmore Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Those two shows are exactly alike. It is so hard to not confuse them. Name wise, we are going to take the quick breaks when we come back. More hot boys, no more Russian arc. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening so far. And let me just tell you that everything ahead of this commercial is much better than what came before it. That's my guarantee. While I have you here, let me tell you about a website. It's called yourpopfilter.com, and it's everything you need that's related to pop filter everything Mike, everything Ryan, everything Greg, everything Cassie. Everything is there at yourpotfilter.com. While you're there, go to yourpotfilter.com slash Amazon. Make that your new Amazon bookmark and do your shopping from there. That way we get a little piece of the action and Amazon doesn't. Make sure you're also listening to everything that Pop Filter has to offer, which includes the Superhero Show Show, a podcast that covers every single TV show that's based on a comic book or comic book property, and Movie of the Year where we sit down and try and figure out what is the single greatest movie of any given year. That superhero show show, that's movie of the year, and that's yourpopfilter.com. Rate, subscribe, review, bye! Tasty Greg. Does this film assume a level of familiarity with Russian history that is hard to live up to as a modern American ignorant audience? And is any of that knowledge necessary to enjoy the movie? I'm going to say yes to the first part and then no to the second part. It's I think it's very similar to the not really knowing Russian, so we're missing a lot of the non yes. subtitled dialogue is like I get the movie yeah. without knowing all these but <laughs> would I get it on different levels if I was like, "Oh, Pushkin, I don't have to look up who that name is." I looked up who Pushkin is cuz that's one of the few names they straight up were like, oh, that's clearly Pushkin with some broad. <laughs> uh-huh. like, oh, a Russian poet. Interesting. And my level of knowledge is like, I was like, oh, yeah, Pushkin. And I've read like a couple of his poems because he's like like the first name in Russian mm-hmm. poetry. Like one of the only ones that, that you'd even think of. You said like poet. Um, but there was like there was a lot of the Catherine the Great stuff. I was just like, I found myself referencing the show The Great. Yes. And I was like, that's very not- helpful. <laughs> it's like it it gets you a little bit of the way there but right um and so like i just i almost wanted to i watched like an annotated version of this or like a vh1 from back in the 90s style like pop-up video version where it could just be like fresh and arc this guy is uh peter the great or peter the great son you know this yeah when they're like peter the great i was like well i've seen the great is peter great Nicholas Holt or Nicholas Holt's dad, who we never meet. That that's Peter. Because that's right? the dad. Yeah, the dad is. That's like and, the and Peter we know sucks. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, and you know, I guess that's what in the, in the great. That's what they're they're always talking about his dad, like as such, like right. the biggest figure of all time, and that's part of what's wrong with him. Um, but I, yeah, it, you don't need it to enjoy it. You don't need it to feel it. I mean, honestly, on top of like knowledge of Russian history, that would help. 
I guess more art history knowledge oh, w- yeah. would have helped me in this because I felt oftentimes lost when they would start talking about the paintings. Like, if this guy is saying something ludicrous about this painting right now, I I don't have yeah, access yeah. to it. I'm just like, oh, he knows a lot, and I will follow <laughs> what he says and say it the next time I'm at a museum. Uh, and especially because he's he hates Russia, the European does, and he's based on a very real guy. The movie never says the Marquis' name, yeah. but he's based on a real dude who apparently was just like, fuck the Russians, right, guys? Um, and I think based on a very real life. sentiment. Like, yes. You know, well, uh, it's the Orient... Orient 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 mm. what's Saeed's book? Orientalism. Orientalism. Orientalism, thank you. Uh it was just broken in my head until I heard it right. <laughs> uh and we often think about it applied to like the Middle East is is how it's often applied or, or the Far East, right? Is China and Japan. But yeah, Russia, like you said, is is also Asiatic. And I think now I cannot remember if the European says it or if reading on the real guy, he says, uh, the problem with the Russians is they are an Asiatic soul stuffed inside of a European body. And it's like, bro, yeah. I don't know what you mean, but I know that's gross. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he is just like such an awful character really. And it's that part of what's difficult about the movie, I think for a Western audience is that like, that's the closest thing we have to us in the movie. Right. <laughs> um, but like, it's either like, <laughs> Russians are not capable of doing great art or mm-hmm. Russians only copy great art or if this is great it necessarily can't be russian or russians can't have like good opinions about art right and so so often when they're going through the different wings it's like well all of this isn't imported like a lot of this has to be russian born art yeah doing a its own thing like to me i'm just like old ass art right (laughs) like (laughs) and notice how often he rejects the the european rejects like anything anybody else says about the art and if yes they want to talk about it in a way that he's not familiar with like he will literally run away from anybody who wants uh-huh. to have a conversation that's not in his wheelhouse yeah we've all met that guy <laughs> <laughs> and he's just so like so I, I feel like you as long as you are aware that that is how it feels to be Russian and to interact with the West. I think that opens mm. up a lot of the movie to you because even now, right. like um, in our current political extremities with, with us and with Russia right now, I feel like I can still see the way in which we otherize and like kind of diminish oh, yeah. Russia at, at every pass, especially when we're just talking probably about its leaders, but we end up kind of painting the whole people with right. Yes, even though we know we are not our leaders. Yes. So often we'll be like, well, they elected that guy, right? Even though elected is clearly not the right (laughs) word. Uh, They're like, so. Uh, And And that they don't do enough. Like, it feels like the the Russian people take a lot of take a lot of flack for, like, not doing enough to stop the government from doing what it's doing. Right. And in a country that, like just went through this with the Iraq war 20 years ago. It is kind of a little ridiculous to be like, Hey, how come you didn't stop your government from murdering a bunch of people? Yeah. Or maybe we're fucking so guilty about that. That's why we're fixated on it. On, on anybody, but we've always been obsessed. I remember my mom say my mom read war and peace. And, and when she was like in high school and my Nana was, she was like, what are you going to become a communist now? Like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading one of the, like in the, in the pantheon of, best books ever written i'm gonna spend time and read one and my mom said she read it and was like oh they're people yeah because she had never thought that and that's what pissed my nana off so yeah. i thought about war and peace when when russia's current war started because i tolstoy says in war and peace that um you know like what was the fever that caught the french up and made them go and just like mass murder a bunch of mm. russians and it's so sort of ironic and heartbreaking that in our modern era it's the russians doing the same thing they just like caught this fever and just kind of like went with it and they just you know either the government that wanted to do it or the people that are just kind of powerless to stop the momentum of the government even in and here like you said that you can be like well that's wrong i don't know what the fuck to do (laughs) like yeah Yeah, you know the the, like they're a lot of them are just trying to get along and Mm -hmm. that's not a good excuse, but I think that the part of the reason we so often loudly, full throatedly condemn what Russia is doing right now is because we just see ourselves mirrored in their right. actions, and we can't take it. Like it's too painful. And I would say they. It's, 
I give them more of a pass since there are legit secret police who like kidnap people in the middle of the night and swallow people for saying the wrong thing. Oh yeah, dude. Uh, about their politics, where we, I don't know, we're just pussies. Yeah, I mean, like, you're allowed to go out in this country and say whatever you want to on the streets. Basically, I mean, they're that they've rolled that back a little bit, but like, if you go out in Russia and hold up a blank sign and it's taken to mean that that's a silent protest, they will come and arrest mm. you for that. And I mean, they'll give you 15 years if you like call what they're doing a war, even though now they right, have started right. to call it a war. <laughs> Look, we can say it. I don't want you saying it. And so that, like that, that inherent tension between, like, and that, that is what the other is, right? Like, I mean, to we, we mentioned Orientalism. Like, the other doesn't come from a random place. It comes from the necessity of saying that something within the centralized culture, like, it needs to put its own sins into mm. some other culture and then and then point right. at that culture and say that's the seat of all of these right. sins and that's i guess ultimately what it is right is that now we want to look at russia and ironically russia's looking at us and what we did in iraq and being like no you can just come up with an excuse and just do what you want to do like we know right. you can do this because we watched you do it like a couple times yeah. in a row and so buddies <laughs> buddies you just say Let's get along. We're just you like just you. call it a peacekeeping operation you just say you're going to be gr- uh, greeted as liberators. You go in there, and when that doesn't happen, you say it's an insurgency or that they're being supported by forces that mm-hmm. just hate your way of life. I mean, it, like, we wrote down the playbook for how you could do this and kind of kind of whitewash it in the international court, you know, even though, right. it, like, they're, they're getting well, away with it. It may not be great for them, but they're getting away with it. Just like we did, and it's we are better at getting away with it. I think because yeah. we're we're better at the diplomacy side of it and our, uh, the cultural side. I think because we export our culture to every corner yeah. of the world. I McDonald's think McDonald's and Coca Cola. Yeah, we like back up a lot of what we're doing in ways big and small. Mm-hmm. And they just have their leader on a horse shirtless, and we're like, "Well, that's weird, guys. That's <laughs> not. <laughs> Come on." But like that's that's the only stuff I think you have to know. And even if you didn't know that, I mean, if you introduce the character of the European mm-hmm. and he comes off the way that guy does, I think even if you didn't know that that's the history of how like Russia has felt like it's been looked at by the right. West. Because <laughs> I didn't think that. about that. I just was like, well, this guy's clearly an ass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you can just jump and go. But what's so funny, but he's clearly an ass, but is also more knowledgeable in so many ways that I'm not. So there's not like my w- views on aren't. My views on art are not changed now because of stuff he said. Mm-hmm. But I was every time he said something about a painting, I wasn't like, "Well, here's probably why he's a dick." Because I'm like, I don't know, may, maybe yeah. this part's true. Like, and this is, I think, how ignorance works. But like, all of the not, all of the not knowing the Russian history to filmmaking, it just to the filmmaker, it just makes me want to dig more. Yes, like every time they say a name, I was just like on Wikipedia. I want to find books, just like I want to watch more of movies by this guy. Yeah. And I well, think that is overall a sign of something working on all levels. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I think that, you know, the, there's a way in which, like, I even wanted to know, like, he backs that kid into the corner. He's talking about the picture that he feels like that the kid doesn't, like, a- appreciate because he hasn't read the Gospels. Yes. And all I could think was, like, I want to hear more about what this kid thinks about this painting because it sounds like he's actually got kind of an interesting idea that you know Peter and the guy and Paul shuts are... it down yeah and then he first he backs him into a corner and then he kind of runs away from him like he won't let this kid say what he wants to say about mm-hmm. the painting even though the kid is like honestly kind of brave about it like he keeps yeah. standing up for himself and he keeps trying to assert what he has to say um but he's just it, not gonna let that happen it reminds me of twitter when people are like where's the evidence and then somebody else is like here yeah. and they're like not reading it it's bullshit <laughs> yeah, and too like, long oh. to read. nice hmm. try Okay. Interesting. Well, that is all the time we have to talk about, I think, mostly modern Russian and Western politics. <laughs> Take the quick breaks, and when we come back, play a little game. Greg, it is time to play a little game. Let's do I it. need to get a better jigsaw voice. <laughs> this is called Genre Switch, in which I will randomly pull... Normally, it's a movie, any movie from 2002, but since we're watching almost all of them, any of the movies we are covering okay. from 2002, and then I will pull out uh, two random genres, and we will create how that movie would be in those genres. I love it. Like a Western any, musical. Like a Western musical. Paint a Wagon is the only Western musical gonna I can think of. Paint a Wagon. Gonna paint it fine. 
I only know that from The Simpsons. Yeah. I don't know that actually an actual real reference. Me neither. It felt very much like a Simpsons joke. And then when I found out that was a real thing, it was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I like when the joke is like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Oklahoma, I guess that's a Western musical. Yep, very good. <laughs> hmm, quite. All right, so first seven up we bride have... for Seven Brothers. Is that a Western? I think so. I've never seen that one. South Pacific, if you go west enough. <laughs> just keep going keep going keep going uh, we have the born identity yes as a space opera slash wuxia film okay wuxia wuxia is uh crouching tiger hidden dragon style action okay well that's perfect then that we're going to be in space right because you know, then gravity yeah gravity so we get that that wire action space opera too i think like because those wuxiang films are like usually kind of like epic and legendary in scale because it's kind of about like mm-hmm. yeah like like larger than life figures i think very operatic yeah where people are like they're not superheroes but they are like people are just like well these guys have powers let's move on yeah because i mean it's kind of like the fighting equivalent of opera i like that because it's like they fight with so much passion and intensity that it leaves the realm of the possible. And that's like the dialogue mm-hmm. becoming a song, right? And it becomes like a, Ooh, a special right. effect or like a, a dance number. So yeah, he is a uh, man, like a space special agent. That would be so cool. They put him in like deep freeze or something. So he forgets yes. who he is. And maybe like, like in aliens three where he wakes up, Somewhere he's not supposed to. Yes. He's just like, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. Yes, and he has to like put it all together, and he has to figure out if he was supposed to come to this place or if he wasn't, and like, mm-hmm. what? Why can't he remember what's going on? Because maybe that's not normally like part of the the space hibernation program. Um, and then Clive Owen has tentacles out of his mouth now. <laughs> and then when he starts finally fighting people, it's like in you know point six gravity or something yes. and so he's like bouncing off the walls and getting like all um getting all athletic with it tom cruise in minority report versus the jetpacks yes somehow <laughs> not having future tech makes you better <laughs> and so i could see that is jason Bourne is like lean he's just like in space leathers yes and they're all packed with stormtrooper style armor and he is just flipping all around and then eventually it has to them. be like okay he was like he was the emperor's number one assassin right. and the emperor told him to do something really gnarly and he couldn't do it. Like the emperor said, kill my daughter. And he's like, no, I can't. And so he put himself into space hibernation and launched himself mm. off into the most random place right. or something like that. I love that. That is your born space opera Wuxia identity. Next up, we have Unfaithful as an animated dark comedy. <laughs> you know, I think it's close to dark comedy already. It really almost is. I mean, remember that moment where he hits the guy with the snow globe, and then like <laughs> yes. that's honestly, I could see in the theaters that's the kind of moment there, like where you have the, the sort of the climax of the film, and somebody just laughs in the theater, and then right. everybody ends up letting go. Um, I love the animated part of it. I think that's very interesting. And I think just like you have to change just a couple of the notes to get it to be right. a comedy. What style of animation do we want? Do we want like 3D animation? Do we want what's that movie with Robert Downey Jr. that was like spirographed on top of uh, sleeping, waking, waking minds? Wait, fuck, I, oh, I know, I know the animation side talking about like Undone on the Amazon on Amazon yes. Prime does that thing. Here's what I think should be good. I think that um, there should be a mix of art styles, which is kind of big in animation right now. But what I would really like is I would like to take advantage of the mix in art styles to draw her home life either very cartoony mm. or just sketch it out. Right. And so we feel like it's not a real presence. And then when she's being like blown around by the wind or when she first meets the, the bookseller the, the guy, Frenchman. It, it like then we're getting like hyper saturated colors. Real fantastical. Yes. Yeah. Old school Disney because it's like this fairy tale. We feel the we feel and literally see the bright colors like well up yes. in her and we see a more defined, more expressed version of her. And we don't have to be told that more of her is alive now because we see it and we feel it just by like viewing the way it appears on the screen. And maybe it is like the, the drab almost uh Kevin can fuck himself drab uh, yes. when she's at home 
but like literally animated musical when she's with a French guy or getting fucked in a restaurant. Uh-huh. Then she starts singing. And I'm thinking we we it, since we're going comedy, I'm thinking we rely on on the history of of animated comedy mm-hmm. to sort of like without getting too zany, but like honestly injecting zaniness into it. Like maybe Richard Gere hits him over the head with like a frying pan or something. Oh, like that. okay. And maybe the guy gets like one bump and then he hits him again and the bump goes back down. And he's like, oh, that's okay. That's fine. And then the guy just dies. The bump goes yeah. into his brain. I like that. Cause I was going to say the, the snow globe has a face and it's like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't you stop smash me. Don't commit murder. I honestly like. I think this one, this one has legs. I think that yeah, this would be an interesting viewing experience. And I'm just gonna say it, not to be too horny on the podcast, but <laughs> uh, sexually explicit. Like, oh, yes. if we're going animated, then that's gonna give us the ability to, in a way that doesn't harm anybody, just right. really get raunchy with it. Just real, real. Because that should be the other side. Like, it, it should be. We should see more of the sex, and then that also helps us. Like connect to what she's really going through rather than just i don't know that movie has like a fair amount of sex in it now that i think about it yeah okay our final film we'll do this with is uh oh it's halloween resurrection <laughs> as a period piece buddy comedy wow you know so not that some things are more random than other things but that's as like random as anything could possibly be <laughs> Here's my pitch because you were you weren't on the resurrection. I was not. Uh, but Busta Rhymes is the shining star of that movie. Okay, legit. He's the only one who gets how stupid it is. It feels. <laughs> I think. Period piece, and this is it's good. We're gonna go Django and Chain style. Busta Rhymes, Mike Michael Myers is a serial killer. Okay, in uh, pre Civil War era, uh, New England. Okay. And Buster Rhymes is an escaped slave, and so they do not like each other, and the government is after them for very different reasons. Okay. I'm so in, So they dude. have to cross, like, cross enemy lines, underground railroad style, get across uh, the states, I, running to Canada, let's say, or, <laughs> or Mexico way. Wow. I think that, you know, obviously you're going to have to, you're going to have to pick your way through some sensitive material here. Right. But one you don't thing, want to piss off your Halloween fans. No, exactly. It's a proud franchise. Uh, one thing that I'm seeing here, though, is that anytime it's just the two of them, Michael Myers is trying to kill Busta Rhymes. <laughs> yeah. But then anytime there's like slavers about, they're both just jointly killing the slavers right. or the the government agents or whatever. But then in almost like almost a playful way, almost like what the child from um, Mandalorian would do if he were always trying to kill yes. Mando. Just like always making this kind Isn't of seem fun, C minus effort to kill Buster Rhymes, and Buster Rhymes like quit it, stop, <laughs> stop. But there's also a scene uh, before they know Michael Myers is really back that Buster Rhymes puts on the mask because yes. you know, he's filming a reality show, and so there there has to be a scene where he's like, okay, you go let the other slaves out, and I'll pretend to be you on this side of the town, and they'll think it's like supernatural or some shit. Oh man, and he's just a. This might be too far, Mike, and tell me if it is. But I imagine he's just supposed to create a distraction, right? But then he kind of gets into it, and then he's mm. like, or I could just kill this awful family, like go room yeah. to room killing this awful family. And then we find ourselves in this position of like we're watching the Michael Myers, dra- like the character of Michael Myers, and we're watching him kill a family, but we're like into it because we think that they're evil because well we know that they're evil because they're slavers and we feel this weird thing of watching him stalk and eliminate this family but like we kind of applaud it right and we're like oh man that would be gross and awful but also everything awful entertaining all right call us up hollywood we got three great ideas man and they're just there we're too lazy to do anything with them go for it legit somebody could bring this up in three days and i'm like Get out of my face. I don't know what you're talking about. We will about. literally never remember that we said any of this stuff. So nope. feel free. Like, some of these ideas are pretty good, actually. Just rip them off. Just, Just rip them off. Happen. Treat them like a band aid and rip them off. Gonna give you a point for that because I loved that. Great. Last sentence you said. <laughs> uh, and we're gonna start that forgetting right now. <laughs> Hola, Felterinos. I just wanted to interrupt real briefly and say thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. If you want to support us a little more directly, you can go to patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. 
there depending on what tier you pick one dollar a month five dollars a month if you're crazy anything more than five dollars a month don't do that you can get extra content there's extra shows extra series uh behind the scenes stuff uh you could pay for ryan to draw you a picture uh, i can write you a poem you can get the shirts off our very own backs all of that and so much more over at patreon.com slash your pop filter while you're on the internet you should check out shady monk he does all the tunes you've been listening to he's on Bandcamp. he's on spotify uh, soundcloud wherever kids get their music these days that i'm too old to know shady monk lives there uh, you can probably follow him on twitter and instagram as well that's shady monk wherever you get music check him out tasty greg with a director who tried to thematically tackle everything <laughs> What topic do you think he handled the most interestingly, if not the best? I think he handled how confusing life is. Um, And I think one thing he got out of the one shot, and I think this is what a lot of people get out of the one shot, is movies have a way of dividing their subjects from the real world. And... Mm. When you do a one shot, you have a way of kind of incorporating the real world because not everything is as neat as it normally is in a movie. It shoves it in real time a little more. Yeah. And because you often move, you often utilize camera movement to get in very close and to get very far away and to have all of that encompassed in one shot uh, is more of human scope and human scale. And so I, I would say... The way in which people wander from room to room, unsure of what's going on, unsure of what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to create meaning out of what they feel is a temporal and temporary experience Mm. and try to piece something together and find some enjoyment, some satisfaction, some reality really um something that feels real and feels like they are they are a part of the world and a part of a a historical movement and not just an atomized individual singular isolated lonely insular being and so i think that that that's what he really captured is is and being part of bigger something bigger than ourselves i think not just the narrator and the European, it it starts off with the the soldiers and the women trying to find the party, and they are already lost, being like, is this the right entrance? And they're going through for a while. He's following them because he's like, I don't know where else to go. Yeah, it looked, it kind of looked like they went in like the servant's entrance, and then yes. they had to like go through like all the, the back of the house stuff to right. find a way through. And you know, Very one of similar the... to another famous one that maybe we talked about in our Patreon, going through the servant's entrance. Yeah, right? Yeah, house. going through the kitchen. Uh-huh. Um, and also, to Catherine the Great, I think, is a great one of those, is like that there's like these rules and how we're supposed to act in certain ways, and then talk about how human it is. She stops the play and yells, I have to piss, and runs out of the room. And it's one of the few times we're like, that is not the narrator of the European, and they are clearly telling us what she is saying right now, and she screams, <laughs> I have to piss. Yeah. <laughs> and because everything's sort of unexpected. Uh, and that's sort of like that high and low, right? Because she's like uh, the, the highest ranking person in the land, mm-hmm. and she has like the most basic human need at that moment, and is on the We've cusp all been of there. being humiliated for it. And, you know, she's an interesting figure, too, to talk about because... Um, as we know from the show, the great, you know, she is like, um, she herself is a German, uh, right. who comes in to be the queen of Russia and Germany is like basically that exact, that's the, that, that, that is like Europe interacting with Russia, right? Like, and so, oh yeah. When her mom or any of her relatives are like Russia, but then the Russians are like, fuck you German pricks. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And even she, even though she's the heroine of that show, she's like, well, I'm going to bring education and enlightenment. And there are a lot of problems with the Russia of that show. Uh-huh. But it takes her a while to be like, oh, I should learn about them and maybe fold in some of the things they believe into what I'm trying to do. Interesting, interesting. Well, one thing that we could have talked about last segment, but we didn't, is that if you read Russian literature, uh, they spend as much time talking about figures like the European from this movie as this movie does. Mm. But then also, at the same time, they honestly do, like, and then go, like, but man, Russia's messed up, man. Like, I wish this place could be a little bit better than it is. I wish we like didn't do things so 
backwards all the time. So like when they're not deflecting the West's constant unfair criticism, Mm -hmm. they do stop and they go like, but there is something kind of up with us. Like we are a hot (laughs) mess. Like how can we, how can we be the best version of ourselves and not so often the version that we end up being? And that's, what's so funny about critiquing Russian art, and being like, well, they can't really think. They can't really making art. Because when you think of like the greatest literary yeah. uh, families or canon, like it's it's Russia, right? Like they're they're fucking up there. Uh, so to poo poo them away is so up your own butt. Poo poo and up your own butt. <laughs> I'm trying to talk about like the greatest literary works ever. <laughs> yeah, great literary works, great philosophy. I mean, you know, Russia is a, a cultural powerhouse. But it has always been made to feel, and it has always mm-hmm. felt susceptible to being cast right. as kind of like, almost like extras in their own story. And I mean, maybe that's a lot of what happens in this movie, is you see people who obviously have their own stories, but they just kind of move through the background of right. this. And they are some of the biggest figures in Russian history. And I, I think it's, we, it's who controls the narrative, right? And we said America exports culture and a lot of just messaging and UK used to do it as well, and then France and Germany have done it. But there's a reason we're like, ah, Russia and China, they suck, right? When the I can't think of two countries closer to power and scale and industrialization as the US. But we're like, but no, only we should be on top, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> And when the, and you they know, believe things that are a little different than us? No. When you interpret their actions through the lens of like what would how would America react if somebody treated us this way? Right. It's like so eye opening often to be like, oh, yeah, I guess we wouldn't like that either. Um, But we are just so used to and the world has kind of had a tendency to be used to situating some Western entity as kind of the center of the world, whether that be Germany or Mm -hmm. France or England or then America. It's like, well, that's what the normative experience is. And then everything else is like some, you know, derived experience from that normative experience. Right. And that's not to excuse what what Russia has done currently in Ukraine or before with Crimea and everything else or or China with the Uyghur Muslims. But look at what we still currently do to indigenous folk in America or people at the border or trans folk more and more in states. So it's it's so easy to be like, but fuck them and be like, don't talk to us about what we do. You (laughs) never talk to us about what we do. And that's the thing, right? I mean, you have to find some way not to have like your average person when they think of Russia or China, they should think of your average Russian or Chinese person. Right. Like, and that's how, that should inform what you think about that. And insofar as it's possible to even think something about an individual from a huge culture and a huge experience that you don't even understand, it should be with like a lot more understanding. But that's right. not to say that the political entities that are doing, yeah, all these horrible things are somehow, um, that we are countenancing that in any right. way. It's just... It is interesting because you've like all the worst things, almost all the worst things we've ever said another nation has done in our very short history. We've done that same thing. So it's like the it's the high horsedness. It's like the why don't you. Hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Why don't we just kind of have an image, you know, like American exceptionalism. Like if you Mm -hmm. if you believe in that, then you're an asshole. And yes. And so it like it doesn't help us to be. I found myself very much watching the character of the European and being like, how do I not be this guy? <laughs> you know, like, because I just think like it's easier to default into that than we'd like to mm. admit, especially when we're talking about other cultures that we don't understand and that are in competition with ours or societies right. that are in competition with ours. You know, I think the European is just 200 years older. Joe Rogan, like with the <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> Mark talking over or running away from like and joe rogan doesn't run away but he does goes eh, no but blah, blah, blah. like he like does not listen to people who disagree with him he steamrolls them yeah and like, i mean i think he does a well i guess i don't know that much about his show but i've always gotten the sense that he does a good job of knowing what a guest is probably going to say mm-hmm. bef- you know before they they get into it <laughs> speed round ah <laughs> In a film with so much overlapping dialogue, did you ever feel, oh, we talked about this. We already talked about the subtitles. Look at us. Next question. Can we treat all paintings like scratch and sniffs like the European does? (laughs) Specifically in that scene you were talking about where he, like, literally corners the kid. And they get to the... (laughs) He is... 
sniffing at it and looks like he's scratching. Can I just do that at museums? Well, uh, probably not. And you probably can't touch the statues the way the one, one woman was doing, unfortunately. Lame. I do have to say, though, that is something about paintings that's exciting, though, right? Is that they, like, in a lot of ways, they don't fully totally set. So they keep smelling. They keep, mm-hmm. like, the some the on some of them, the paint, like, always kind of stays wet. And that's sort of exciting, the idea that it, like, is almost still a living thing in a way. But, yeah, I think they don't want you to go over and start sniffing them, Mike. <laughs> I, I did like that the, the woman who touched the statues, she was blind. Yeah. And I did like that the docents were like, well, obviously we'll let her touch. Come on, guys. I think that she, makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah. But it's just, it's the unfortunate thing where if a human sees another human do something, even if the first person. Why can't reason, I do yeah, it? Yeah. I want to touch the statue. No, you don't, dude. You don't even care about that. Come on. How many farts did they have to edit out of this? 2,000 people over 90 minutes is a <laughs> lot of farts. <laughs> well, you know, we could have gotten a little bit more into. Like what? What counts as a one shot? Like what tricks are you allowed to do when it still counts as a mm. one shot? Not laying in any of the audio or using computers to edit out when cables and stuff appear. Right. That is, I still think it counts as a one shot. I'm not saying to take away its its one shot card, but it is interesting how that kind of pushes against like the exercise in some ways. Right. I do think this is a one shot versus, uh, bird. Not Birdman. Is it Birdman? Or yeah, the, or like 1917, where they go in like really close into someone's jacket, and then it's like right, they use or that as the... whip in a hallway because yes. it's dark, and it's like, well, yes, you looked like a one shot. Interesting. They had a couple opportunities where they could have done it. They went through a dark hallway in this where they could have gotten away, but they only it only would have saved them like ten minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean that the European decides to stay? I don't think anybody gets to stay. I think that they're going to very different places. Like, mm. I, I guess, I guess I don't think anybody actually goes to heaven or hell in this necessarily. But like, um, he's not whatever experience needs to like give him the quietude of like non-existence. He just doesn't right. have yet. He hasn't learned the lessons of being a dead person yet. He just is <laughs> so, so he awful. To, he's too awful still. Greg. What does the man building his own coffin mean other than this is Russia, like everything in this movie is Russia? Uh, that, I, I wish we had a, a friend who is more of a Russophile because I would love <laughs> to, like, that to me seems like a very Russian thing. I'm building my own coffin, and if you come anywhere near it, I'll attack you because <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> Bro, you're going to need help getting into that coffin, so you're going to need at least somebody around. Lay but down I just first. think I, powerful image, right? Maybe a real thing that really, like, it comes from history right. but if not right. just an extremely powerful image that's the the power of ignorance is to not be like oh that's that guy to be like wow yeah what a metaphor <laughs> uh would you say that this movie has a plot or do movies need plot or has plot as a device taken over as one of the few elements of film that people engage with anymore yeah, I do think that there is a tendency for people to hyper focus on plot when we used to when we talked about art, we used to look at a lot of other elements. And not that nobody ever does, but I just think that plot has kind of dominated the other elements of our discussion of of um movies. And I think this has everything kind of but a plot. I mean, I do think the plot is like souls in this waiting room before they go back into the big mixer like whatever it is that in that dark at the end of that dark hallway right um and so there is kind of a plot ish i will say though like it does make it a little bit of a harder viewing experience it just does like it, it I, I i don't need plot i'm not a baby i'm a very smart movie person so i can just watch anything and then and then get something out of it but i literally fell asleep during this movie a couple of times and it's because like there is something compelling about plot. It moves us through the hour and a half viewing experience in a way. Yeah, it's one of those things. I don't want to shit on plot. Plot can be important, but it's especially like TV. People are broken these days, and yes. they'll be like, plot didn't even move forward in that episode. It's like, brother, when every TV series had 24 episodes, we didn't care about that. In yeah. my day, they were in a bottle episode. It was Christmas, and somebody's pants were lost. That's all you get. And I mean, it does not move a plot forward. There's dialogue, characterization, yes. imagery, that, all these things that like help to yes. create the the whole project. It, it really does feel like more than there's so many things, and I don't want to be an old and say people are turning into babies because I think it's people in other older generations, our generation. Uh, but it is the babification of watching things of like no why is the plot moving? And I do have to say there is a certain tyranny to plot in that. Um, 
Ooh, it adds the like write um, that book the tyranny <laughs> of plot a certain like logic to the situation and then structures mm. it in a certain way that is kind of artificial our lives don't have plots and so to not have the heavy hand of plot on it you also then don't have to have a lot of exposition because plot requires you to explain to the audience what the stakes are and what's going on if you don't have that you don't have to say where you are you don't have to say what's going on because you don't need those forces to move you through a story you just have an experience this movie is an experience unlike any other that we've had on this show so far for sure and putting in plot would have changed that dramatically so i just don't think i don't think you could do like the Even one shot the same way had a more of a plot yes which is a, a crazy thing to say yeah also russian right yeah and also kind of russians effed with time in the same way like mm-hmm. you know memory like moving through memory as because it's that and you know that's a dying man right or a man in a fever right going through it and that's so it's kind of the same movie in a way because this guy's already uh... died but like they're just on right on opposite sides of the veil. They're just all like right on the other side of the veil in the two. He's too much speed round. Ultimately, <laughs> is this the most Russian movie ever made, or is it an important film that just happened to do a Russian museum instead of Cameroon or Spain? I guess I'm gonna go with the most Russian movie ever made. I think I, I think I right. am heavily in leaning towards the like best Russian movie I've seen, but it's just between the two that I have to go with. And the other one mirror was like, was very important. So it's hard to say, mm. but um, I just think that there is the questioning, the existential sort of like angst, the, um, the love for Russia, but the, the, the figure of the person who hates Russia in it. I don't know. I think it, it only works with Russia really. Does this movie become one of the great examples of how maybe you shouldn't go into a movie cold? Is this film an argument for looking things up and learning a little bit before you watch? I think you... I think you should watch the movie once and just be lost. I think that there should be... I think the first time you watch a movie, if it's going to be a really complicated movie, the first time you watch it, you should be prepared to be like, I literally have no idea what happened in that It's part of the experience. Yeah, and then... The second viewing, the third viewing, that's when I think... I don't think there's anything wrong with with, re, with doing research ahead of time, but I think there it might be better to watch it once, be lost, watch it again, again try to pick some stuff up, and then bring research into the equation. Because I just think... And not into one week. No. Like, you don't need to be a crazy person like we do, but yeah. like, if you're... And in, if you're not a baby, if you're an enjoyer of art and film, I, that that is like, and this could be over a few years, right? Because something's gonna stick with you. Yes, uh, and I, honestly, you have to have a period where your brain lays fallow, like where the material is in there, and you live your life in connection to it. Like mm. you take a text with you all through your life, and then that's when it begins to kind of filter through those experiences, and you start to understand it. So I would almost say you have to space it out we do kind of an artificial thing here where we cram it all into one week where we're also leading our hectic lives and trying not to get sick from the fucking moldy (laughs) bread we eat (laughs) okay i told you that in confidence (laughs) don't eat moldy bread even if you're about the pieces of mold guys i had a week is this set in the war and peace universe or the great universe two works of art we've brought up Yeah, and I guess that's what that question really gets at, right? Like, it's so hard not to just be like, oh, I know some other stuff stuff about Russia. Russia, I get it. <laughs> it's all the same. It feels, because I guess it doesn't, it is heavy. It feels closer to the great. I don't know. It's I was going to say the opposite. Feels I think it's way in more between. war and really? PC. Like, having a big ball that everybody goes yeah. to. Because, like, honestly, if this were the great, then there would be a lot more people, like, getting sick from drinking too much. Or they would have, mm-hmm. like put foley farts in there so we could hear them (laughs) or like yeah like i mean the the russians in the great are very much conceived of by someone who's a lot more like the european right right like i mean it's it like it tries not to be in some at some points but i think that the russians are portrayed very much in a western style in the great is this a better movie than golden eye 64 (laughs) no The, it's the same bobbing and breathing yes, when it's just yeah. pausing for bum, a bum, 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 bum. And finally, this is a staggering work of art and a technically brilliant production that is almost staggering in its scope. How many times did you fall asleep during it? I'm going to say I watched this movie two and a half times. I think I literally fell asleep four total times over that. Like, not like, you know, where I woke up 15 minutes later, but like where right. I would suddenly just be like, okay, your eyes are closed. And I'm like, oh, yes. Open these oh, bad boys. That's back a up. long blink. <laughs> 
Let's just jump right in to awards. Greg, single weirdest moment. The single weirdest moment, I think, is when, uh, they suddenly walk into, like, 2000, uh, and right. you just see people in backpacks. I was not prepared to see a person wearing, like, just a sweater, jeans, and a backpack, and the uh, European goes, of what milieu are these people? Because <laughs> he looks <laughs> at the way they're dressed, and he's so shocked and appalled. So, And then that whole scene, basically, like, if I wanted to, like, span that, it would be all the way to the end of that, which includes one of the docents... Uh, after these kicked him out very slowly opening the door and then blowing like some version of a raspberry at the european right and then the european doing it back like the movie becomes a fever dream in that yes. like 10 minute period it very there's another time when the european i think it's right before this when the european is hanging out with the blind lady a guy with a giant like tome just is following them yes very closely yes for no reason and i'm like well he probably has a reason. I was just like, this means something. Don't to me nope, that very much hazard. seemed like you know he's doing the ledger. Like who's gonna get to heaven? Who's gonna go to hell? Oh, and I'm not shit. sure if that exists in this in this movie, but it just seemed like he was doing some accounting or something, some observing and accounting. Most wanted costume. I hate to say it, but it's the Europeans, all black with like the oh man, the what? shoulder he's like a is so dramatic. Vampire. Oh, God, yeah. Like, I don't know. I know he's supposed to be awful, but there is, like, kind of a slinky, old, mm. creepy um, sensuousness to him that I found myself responding to. <laughs> pa- nope. Uh, cringiest moment. Uh, that stuff where he cornered the young guy, I like, where they're talking about the Peter and Paul. Yeah. Yes! Because he it's gets really close to him, and, like, he's got a weird sexual energy with several characters, but there's yes. something so violent and sexual about that. And props mm. to the kid who stands up to him, both as an actor <laughs> and as a character. <laughs> that must have been hard. But, uh, yeah, that part had me literally, like, cringing. Uh, yes to that, and also in that same scene, I... I do think he scratched and sniffed that painting, and that made me cringe. Like, you don't fucking touch that. Oh, and I feel like he like rubbed his, and I was like, I think the actor legit just touched That's this ancient painting. This is not okay. <laughs> uh, pound for pound performance. This is such a weird one, uh, but I'm going to give it to the cameraman because uh, oh shit, he was such an active presence in the scene, and he really did imbue the like you realize at some point that it's not just that that's the camera, that's the guy, you know, that's one of the guys. And I just think that the cameraman really pulls that off and it's quite a performance. And holding just like as an athletic feat, holding that down. We'll give it to him. Uh, Director's director's signature moment. I'm going to go with the big one shot, Mike. I'm going to say that's the thing you really come away with. Well, the one shot. Yeah. (laughs) Yep, that would be it. Now, uh, what is your recommendation? If okay, you watch this and want something. This is gonna this is gonna feel like a little bit of a long shot, but on the Home and Garden Network, there is a show called The Ugliest House in America, and it is hosted by Retta. Uh, and in one of them, she goes down into this basement, and uh, it becomes almost like something out of Atlanta because here is Retta looking glamorous and beautiful, walking through this weird uh, basement, <laughs> this weird subterranean structure, and it just keeps going. And though it becomes a big, long one shot while she goes down this hallway. (laughs) Uh, And it made me think of this and it creeped me out. And I just wanted to say, I love this show because a lot of shows in the Home and Garden Network, they look at like fucked up houses and then they go and they fix them. Not Uh this show. Retta comes into your house. She makes fun of it nonstop. She makes fun (laughs) of you for owning the house. Then she talks about why it's ugly and she leaves and they don't do anything to make it better. Delightful. (laughs) Uh, that is a great recommendation. Mine is uh, came back a few years ago, starring Rooney Mara and Casey Affleck, called A Ghost Story. And Casey Affleck dies, wears a literal bed sheet, and haunts his house. And time gets fucked with you. You don't know how much time is passing. And it, it's it's weird, and it's ethereal. It's the only, halfway through this movie, I was like, oh, that vibe. There was something about it clicked a lever in my brain. All right. The moment everybody's been waiting for, I'm going to tabulate. Yes. Tab it up. All right. Ryan did get three points. <laughs> Which is not bad for a show that you're not even on. Like, that's pretty right. good. He gave a few compelling looks. <laughs> the boldness of the exercise. Greg, you got 57 points. Wow. Got to feel pretty good about that performance, Mike. 58 points. <laughs> so you won. How do we think Russian Arc will do in the bracket? 
Um, this is the kind of movie that you watch it and I was impressed with it and I really liked it. Uh, but we got into talking about it and I think it was some point during speed round where it was like, oh, this could be a double episode. Yeah. Like we could just start over again and talk about all these aspects that we didn't talk about and start getting into scenes and really analyzing individual scenes. And, um, the depth to this movie and the lack of ever explaining itself. It does not give a fuck if you understand what's going on or not. Mm-hmm. And that's what wins around here. And so I don't know if it's going to win. I also, we haven't heard from Ryan, but right. through the, through the, like just peering through what's been said off air and stuff like that. I'm thinking he didn't love it, which I thought he was going to love it. So uh, that might, that might really hold it back. But I was, I'm going to say, I personally am kind of blown away by this and is maybe one of the most interesting things that we've watched. Yeah, of any season, I can't think of a movie I want to see in a theater more. You're gonna than fall this. asleep. I, I I think in a theater is where you truly won't. You'll just yeah. like lock in. Um, and it's only gonna be old people in there with you, so nobody's gonna be on their phone to distract you. Uh, but yeah, it, it was. I was shocked how phenomenal it was because again if something takes you four times to start and finish yes you're like well probably gonna hate this right but by the time i actually got through i was like oh i shouldn't start this at 10 30 at night yeah. after a full day of meetings fair and like how many movies could you start and stop four times and then have a nice experience like right yeah so well, I think it's got what it takes dude i i, I don't know like it could it, be a it's, dark it's horse. a dark horse but i think it is definitely in the running well, that has been Russian Arc. Thank you to our winner and my best friend and blueberry muffin gatherer, no Greg. No problem, Mike. No problem. Coming up the rest of the season, we have The Two Towers, 25th Hour Adaptation, and so much more. Until then, keep watching those movies. Americans overwhelmingly support the right of an individual to make their own decisions about abortion. Unfortunately, that right is no longer protected anywhere in the U.S. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade on June 24th. Abortion is a basic health care need for millions of people who can become pregnant. Restricting access to comprehensive reproductive care, including abortion, threatens the health and independence of all Americans. Even if you live in a state where abortion rights are upheld, access to safe medical procedures shouldn't be determined by location, and it shouldn't be the privilege of a small few. And we're already seeing certain medical practices be restricted even in those states. You can help by donating to local abortion funds. To find out where to donate for each state, visit donationsforabortion.com. That's the number four, donationsforabortion.com. If you or someone you know needs help or if you want to get more involved, here are five resources. One, Shout Your Abortion is a campaign to normalize abortion. Two, Don't Ban Equality is a campaign for companies to take a stand against abortion restrictions. 3. Abortion.cafe has information about where to find clinics. 4. PlantCPills.org provides early at-home abortion pills that you can keep in your medicine cabinet. And 5. Choice.crd.co. That's choice.crd.co. Has a collection of these resources and more. You can also find all the links to these resources at podvoices.help and in the show notes. We encourage you to speak up, take care, and spread the word.